to continue on a little bit uh, from what we heard in that wonderful last talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about molecular diagnostics from 2003 to 2020. So many of you probably know this, uh, and we already heard some of this, but rare disease isn't particularly rare. Although in the US it's a disease that uh, affects fewer than 200,000 patients, 30% of a rare disease, sorry, 30 of children with a rare disease won't see their fifth birthday. There are 7,500 different types of rare disease. Many are genetic. 10% of the population has a rare disease. Unfortunately, the average time for diagnosis of one of these patients, if they get one, is more than seven years, with eight attempts at a diagnosis. Three or four misdiagnoses. 35% of deaths in the first year are due to a rare disease. We, we combine the fact that it takes, on average, more than seven years to get a diagnosis, and more than 30% of kids with a rare disease die before their fifth birthday, we see we're not in a great place. And it has a huge impact. Obviously, it has a huge impact on the family and the patient, but it also has a huge impact on the people who are caring for those individuals. 92% of physicians say that when they see a patient with a rare disease, even for routine care, there needs to be more appointments, and appointments have to be longer. 60% of patients with rare disease say that they have received conflicting information about what to do, 95% of rare diseases don't have an FDA-approved drug. There's probably a little more than this now, but there's not a lot of centers of excellence uh, for genomic medicine, which is what I'm going to talk about to deal with getting a diagnosis for those patients. More than 10% of the uh, inpatient costs in a hospital system come from the 2% of rare disease patients. And overall, it's 6.6 .6 times more expensive to treat uh, a patient with a rare disease than an individual who does not have one. So I mentioned I was going to talk about molecular diagnostic timeline. What you can see here is a timeline that starts in 2003. If you were unfortunate enough to have a child that had a rare disease, but you were fortunate enough to, let's say, live in the United States, and you were fortunate enough to live somewhere close to one of these centers of excellence, such as the one that we're standing in just now, and you were fortunate enough that your child lived uh, for those first few days, and you were fortunate enough that your child was healthy enough uh, to be tested, my colleagues, I'm a PhD, my colleagues with MDs tell me that back in 2003, if you got them into that center of excellence, that genetics clinic, about 5% of the time, they would leave with a definitive diagnosis. Between 2003 and 2010, the world changed a lot. So it changed in many different ways, uh, but some of the ways that it changed is in terms of our ability to sequence a human genome, the Human Genome Project and projects beyond that. It also, importantly, also improved uh, in terms of the technology that we had, computer science, compute, and IT. But by 2010, if you were that parent, again, you would probably leave about 5% of that time with a diagnosis for your child. However, since 2010, things have got much better. And you can see the numbers in the middle there going up from 5% to the 20s to the 30s. I would argue currently, and I'll come back to this, in the 40s. And let's see where we can go from here. So how do, we, how do we do better? Well, one of the things that we did, I mentioned sequencing. We moved from the prior, prior types of sequencing. We brought in the ability to sequence people's exomes or people's genomes. Across rare disorders, I would argue an exome for many of those patients is the best first test to do when you want to get a molecular diagnosis. That's certainly what we saw in 2012 and 13. If you know me, you know I'm a big proponent of whole genome sequencing as a molecular diagnostic test. That also then raised those numbers. And we can see one of the ways this became possible is because those sequencing costs were, drop, were lowering. But that's not all we did. At the same time as getting that sequence data, we improved our ability to identify deleterious variants. So I'm going to go through a case here. 
This is from the NIH. This is also a case that came through the Undiagnosed Disease Network that um, Zach talked about. Patient had developmental delay, epilepsy, rigidity, bradykinesia, Parkinsonian tremor, macular degeneration, retinal dysfunction, skeletal abnormalities, all in one individual. This was one of the earliest cases. We did whole genome sequencing back in 2014. And lo and behold, we found a homozygous variant in a gene called PARC7, which explains the early onset Parkinson part of this patient's clinical presentation. But we also found a homozygous variant in ABCA4. And this gene is associated with retinitis pigmentosa. And then we didn't stop there. We kept looking. We found another homozygous variant in LBR. LBR is associated with Greenberg skeletal dysplasia. So we found a single patient that had three different diseases. You can see here which one explains for which symptom. Of course, it was a little suspicious finding all these homozygous variants when we looked. It turned out that this patient actually had chromosome 1 uh, paternal isodisomic uniparental disomy. This isn't that rare. About half of the patients that we see have more than one disorder. It's probably an overestimate in a way because we see very complicated patients just now. But maybe it's an underestimate, as Zach just pointed out, because we're not really able to see all the other variants in that individual's genome that may be contributing to their clinical presentation. We also pushed that boundary by developing some new ways of identifying molecular variation associated with disease. So this is another patient from the UDN that came from Vanderbilt, a 31-month-old male with a heart defect, hypotonia, dysmorphic features, and lots of other symptoms, able to sit at seven months, stand at 24 months, but not walking, can only use two words and some signs to communicate. Interestingly, had uh, hyperpigmentation, so here, we decided again to go for a whole genome sequence. And what did we find? Well, we found that, and this was a whole genome sequence from fibroblasts, from the lighter and darker skin. We looked at B allele frequencies, which are normally at 1.5 and 0 for an individual who's diploid. We saw additional bands in both of those samples. It turns out that this individual has some cells that are diploid, some cells that are triploid, they're actually a mixoploid individual. X, 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 Y, X, X, Y. This just shows the percentages of triploid cells in this individual. That isn't the only mixoploid individual that we've seen within the UDN. So we've now seen three of those cases, so we can use whole genome sequencing to identify these types of chromosomal abnormalities. Out of the first 250 UDN cases, we are able to do genomes and find a triplet expansion disorder, a bunch of structural variation, now three mixoploid individuals, other chromosomal abnormalities, and lots of small insertions and deletions that were the causal variants in those individuals. Our molecular diagnostic success rates just above 28%, which I was a little disappointed about, but when I thought about it, these are really complex cases. When we went back and we looked to see whether these individuals had prior testing, it turned out that 76% of them had already had an exome, and most of them had many years' worth of testing. So a whole genome plus these new methods for variant calling leads us to a 45% success rate. So that's where we're at, but what can we do now? Well, I don't have time to go into this, but one of the things that we can do is use other technologies to find other sorts of molecular events that can underpin disease. And some of those types of data are shown here. But even once we can identify all of that variation, we still have some problems. And one of the problems is, even if we can sequence as a commodity, we can analyze rapidly to identify variation, we're still way too slow at the interpretation. So one of the things that we focus on in my group is trying to actually automate this process, automate the process of interpreting molecular variation for a patient's disease. This is just a tool that we, use, a couple of tools that we use. We're getting much better at this. When we look at 92 cases that we have within the UDN, and we just use our tools to try and find the variants that we had an expert, a human already say were causal, we're getting good. 
we get the top variant with no human intervention 56% of the time. The expert identified variants are placed in the top 10 96% of the time. So I would argue informatics will take us to the point where we can actually do whole genome sequencing and analysis and interpretation for many more patients. Even then, finding and interpreting the causal variant is just the start. So if you're an individual, a family, or a clinician, you have five main questions. What's the diagnosis? How did it happen? Who else is at risk? What can be done? What can we expect? The last two points, what can be done and what can we expect, are beyond the diagnosis. So what can we do for that patient? What will happen to them? Case study, this was a male diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, positive family history, many different normal, usual symptoms for CF. Very severe disease. He unfortunately had to have a lung transplant at 20, and he died at 24 because of chronic graft failure rejection. But he gave us a blood sample just before his death for whole genome sequencing. Unfortunately, his family history was such that he had an older brother and a younger brother who were affected with CF. We did whole genome sequencing in that first brother. We looked at things like pharmacogenomics. Can we find anything in his genome that would help us work out what to tell the doctors to help them to treat him better? We found uh, a number of different things in his genome that were related to a number of the drugs that he actually had been given. Antifungals, he had a reduced response to diuretics and bronchodilators, required lower dose of opioids, lower dose increased risk of toxicity from immunosuppressants, reduced short-term response to steroids. We also are interested because these three brothers had very different clinical presentations, so we're looking for genetic modifiers that can help explain that particularly these factors here. And we have found some indication of genetic modifiers with a reasonably large effect that may account for some of these differences. With that, we have been funded by the Legacy of Angels Foundation and the CF, the CF Foundation to do this work on many more CF patients. So we can go beyond the diagnosis. We can look for other things that alter a phenotype. We can extract information that can help with the selection of drugs. But that's, again, just the second step. There are many other things that we need to do. We need to work on data sharing, not just the identified causal variant, but these modifiers as well. We need to free the clinical data. If you were here yesterday, you heard a whole session on that that I thought was wonderful. We need to develop a technology so the patients who can't get to Stanford's genetic clinic can still get a diagnosis. We're going to hear more about that shortly. We need a method to get the patients to the right doctor who knows what to do uh, with them. We need to add in foundations and genomics for everyone in medical school so there are more doctors that know what to do. So we've come a long way, uh, but we're really just getting started. Thank you very much.